Welcome to the South Fork Sea Farmers Presents. Today's topic is sustainable landscaping. Our guests are Edwina Van Gaal, landscape designer and founder of the Perfect Earth Project, and Paul Munoz, owner of Eco Harmony and chairman of the Energy and Sustainability Committee of the East Hampton Town Board. Thank you both for taking time out of your busy day to be with us here today. My pleasure. Um, thank you for having us. It, it's you both chose career paths that really kind of tried to change the way Americans think about their American dream and how it's going to look. You know, how, what, the, what their house, their, their property is going to, um, how it's going to present itself. I often go back to that um, Loving Spoonful song, What a Day for a Daydream, and that idea of falling on my face on somebody's new mowed lawn. That, that when I was younger and taking care of my parents' lawn, that mattered to me. Having a beautiful, landscaped, flat, green, trimmed lawn and falling on my face in it was something I did. But now we're trying to think of things a little differently. Um, you've, taught, you've, you've both gone in the direction of trying to take chemicals out of that process. So let's start with, why do we have to change? Why, why, why can't we have that manicured lawn, why do we have to change and, and not have the things to keep it green, like all those things we put on our lawn to keep it just so? Well, I think that um, actually that's not altogether what I am doing because what I'd like people to know is you can absolutely have a green lawn <laughs> there is, that is sustainable. There, that You're not giving that up. And it can be as manicured as you like. You're, you do not have to give that up. Um, we would suggest that it be maybe smaller because there is a lot of resource that goes into making a lawn, a certain amount of fossil fuel for mowing. There's nothing like a lawn. I totally agree with you. you know, but once it gets past the amount that you're actually using, that additional space could be used for something better. So why is that important? Because that's something better is the land that we took away from our wildlife and from our environment. So that something better it should be serving the birds and the bees. So when you when you say smaller, is there, is there a formula we can we can think about? Is there uh, a percentage of an acre, or is there a, you know a ratio that would work? I think. You don't have to get that technical. You just think about what do I really use? Because most people don't use all of their lawn. Yes. They barely even walk on it. So if you take that into account, then I think it's easier to let go of some of that lawn. And like Edwina said, uh, use it for something more useful. And not separate wildlife and the insects from us because they benefit, but we benefit from them as well. And the science is there that their populations are in decline drastically. So let's talk about that a little bit. The, the insects that benefit population decline and why is that a, a result of how we traditionally take care of our, our landscape? One, the chemicals, but also in the maintenance that goes into it. We are, we interrupt their, their daily life, their habitat, their food source by cleaning and maybe controlling too much of our outside space, especially leaf blowers. Okay, tell, tell me about that. Because leaf blowers, I think of as a nuisance mostly because of noise. And yeah, most people think about the noise, right. but uh, you're blowing away a lot of nutrients in the soil if the soil is bare and there's no mulch on it. Uh, you're blowing away hibernating insects if you're doing it too early in the springtime, which most people do. So that's just one example on how we help with their population decline. What insects are we, what, what species are, are there in the early spring? Because this is, this is like brand new to me and it's very interesting. Moths, and caterpillars, what else? Well, are yeah, there? well, caterpillars are part of a moth's yeah. life cycle. Right. Many of them lay their eggs on the underside of a leaf. So they fall from the tree to the ground, and that's yeah. just part of their life cycle. So if they can stay where they fell, 
they can complete their life cycle. And one easy to remember connection is that birds need caterpillars to feed to their young. And without them, 96% of our backyard birds absolutely have to feed insects to their young. Most of that is caterpillars. Caterpillars are in abundance, ideally, in a, in a safe place if they have one, at exactly the time that their babies are hatching. And without that source of protein, and it's also a keratin, which helps them develop the color in their feathers, which helps them then as adults for breeding. So it's a really interesting, Doug Tellney said, what is it like, I think a chickadee needs six to six to 9,000 caterpillars to raise a, one nest of young. Okay. And for them to get back to their traditionally uh, high population, they should be raising two or three nests a season. So that's a whole lot of caterpillars. Yeah. And what do most people do if they see a caterpillar on a leaf? They crush it. They kill it. Yeah. They call in the spray guy. Right, right. They call them because the spray that guy. caterpillar yeah. may be taking little bites out of the edge of a leaf. Well, maybe a week later, the arborists come in and cut away a third of the tree and nobody blinks. Mm -hmm. Uh, true, true. But they do it neatly. They don't they leave rough edges. They chop <laughs> right through living wood, yes. which the tree then has to heal. Caterpillars, I think the caterpillar scalloping is actually maybe what you were saying, perceptions change. Mm -hmm. So it should be a thing of joy. You don't even see it unless you get up close. Yeah. And so getting close to your trees is a good idea. But you're right. I think many people see a caterpillar, one caterpillar, they think, oh my God, all the leaves on my tree is going to be eaten, I have to have it sprayed. That right. would be a, a way too normal reaction at this point. Right. right. So are you prepared to have 20,000 caterpillars in your yard so that you can have chickadees? Because right. they, they can't be more than a quarter mile from the nest. Too much flying wears the bird out, gathering food. Oak trees are the hosts for more than can be what? Some close to 500 different moth and, cat moth and butterfly species. I, I didn't even know there were that many species on the East End. Don't ask me to name them. <laughs> 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 so w something we've kind of touched on is that, um, you know, practices have to change. So to maintain uh, your property, whatever, wherever that property is, in a way that is sustainable, not, not just sustainable when we're talking about how the property looks, but sustainable and how that property interacts with the larger earth, the water, the air. Okay. What are some of the practices that could change? What are, what are some of the habits uh, we should get out of and replace with different habits? Um, one example would be definitely connect more with your outdoor space, but when you're maintaining it, maybe use what you have before you bring in inputs like fertilizer or anything else from the outside that you buy at a garden center. Because everybody has leaves in the fall, so you could use that as a natural fertilizer for your lawn if you do choose to keep your lawn. Mm -hmm. uh, mulch your uh, grass clippings, cut them and let them fall back to the grass. Very simple things you could change. That a lot of people don't do because they don't like to walk on their lawn and have the grass clippings on their shoes on their or shoes. their feet. Yeah. And they might come in the house. Yeah. But that's maybe a, if you do it right and you have a biologically active lawn, mm -hmm. which happens when you stop using chemicals, and if you let your grass get tall and you mulch mow, on mine, the clippings don't even last half a day. Always mow your lawn when it's dry. Otherwise, you do get big, slimy, clumps. nasty clumps. <laughs> yeah. And if they're, and, and like we said, you're not walking on most of your lawn. So if there is a small spot where you do walk right after mowing, mm -hmm. you, you can pick those. Yeah. You can even blow them away with an electric blower. Mm -hmm. so you, you just use the term biologically active lawn. Yeah. So how, how does using uh, artificial fertilizers 
prevent us from having a biologically active lung? And can you tell, you know, it, describe what a biologically active lawn is, looks like, feels like? Well, I'd like to think about it. If you're just feeding it chemicals, then it's going to become an addict. And once you stop giving it those chemicals, it won't be able to survive. Whereas if you feed the soil, then you're feeding the grass and any other plants that you may have around. So think about soil as living organisms that work together to give you all that that you see above ground. So the idea of thinking of soil as its own ecosystem of many organisms versus Billions. dirt, yeah. um, minerals. <laughs> totally. You know, um, mm -hmm. And that it, the soil is also alive. Yes. Full of life. Yeah. Like billions of lives in a teaspoon of soil. Fungi, bacteria, and insects. Microbes, microscopic. Those are all the things that pesticides kill. Which would do the work of the fertilizers if they If they're were given, there. right. Like, there's so much great stuff out now about the amazing mycorrhizal networks, because that's a of the fungal life of the soil and how it helps plants communicate and breaks down mm -hmm. organic matter. And I read something recently about uh, even doing a vegetable garden by um, putting cardboard down, mulching over the cardboard and then just planting on, in the mulch and letting the roots of the plant go down through the cardboard and that you would not have weeds and that you keep that network underneath intact. Does that make sense? Yes. It, it makes great sense, but yesterday I was listening to a podcast, as I do when I'm driving mm. in Hamptons traffic, and there's a, uh, there's a woman who is really great, Linda Chalker Scott, who does the science part. She then actually studies these things. She said that the cardboard should not be used because okay. the cardboard mm. deprives the soil of oxygen. And the, the micro, microbial life needs oxygen. And the, the mulch alone will do the trick in terms of, like, she said you do not want to smother your soil. You want to smother the, org the, the stuff that's there. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you're starting with old mm -hmm. lawn or yeah. something, right. what you're really doing is depriving that layer of light. But you don't want to deprive it of water or gotcha. oxygen. I think it's a really interesting mm -hmm. thing. You just never stop learning. I remember the piece I read said you could not use waxed cardboard. It had to be you know, something that water could soak through. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the but it's less likely to soak through once it gets dry, you know, it gets mm -hmm. dry and yeah. crispy. And yes. I yes. think she because I have a whole section of my yard that right now is covered with cardboard and mulch, <laughs> and so I'm watching it. I have to rethink that, huh? Mm, I might. <laughs> yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah, because so many people are talking, yeah. and I've been selling the cardboard and chips mm -hmm. idea, and I really like it that she actually does trials on all these things. But that, going back to your original question about why, because mm -hmm. that's like, that's really the crux of it. Like, yes. why are we doing any of this? Right. Yeah. And like, so when you, like, for a daydream, you know, falling on your face in the new mode lawn, you probably weren't worried then about what's in that lawn. Right. And that's, that's it. Like, what's, what are people putting on their lawn? Unnecessarily, but it's a business model. Yes. If we all did what Paul said, keep all our leaves, keep our branches, keep everything, feed it back to the place that made it as food for itself, we wouldn't be buying anything. Oh, that's not a business. <laughs> well, it's so, a different business. Yes. It's, your, it's, it's you having a relationship right. with your place, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. and not buying something that comes in plastic and then you have to dispose of that plastic container. It didn't get driven around from a manufacturer to a depot to this to there mm -hmm. with fossil fuels. It's absolutely, and we're not then sending, because we now send our landscape, it is not waste, our landscape not waste, <laughs> to the landfill where the landfills are overflowing mm -hmm. and it causes, it creates methane 
Um, a lot of those grass clippings go into the landfill. You can't use them, or I would, you can't use them for composting because they're filled with slow, relief, slow release herbicides that are persistent in the compost. So when you're actually using that compost, you're putting down a, a, a growth inhibitor. Right. Not, right. Your, not right. what you had in mind. No, not what most people are composting to do. Yeah. Right. So if you make your own, and it doesn't really take it. I mean, compost happens. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do a thing. Just heap it up in some corner if you don't want to deal with it. So besides then this living ecosystem, the, the, what we call dirt, um, the chemicals we're putting on our lawn also wind up, you know, drinking. And in, they're in your body because they're absorbed through your skin. Okay. They, um, yeah, they cause just what they do to the soil biome, they do to your biome. Because now we know that we have biomes. Mm -hmm. Not only a gut biome, we have all kinds of biomes. And they do exactly the same thing to your biome as they do to the soil biome. They kill your little microbial insects. And so, so explain to the audience, what, when you talk about humans having a biome, what, what do we mean? I, I think most people know now that your gut is a, a biome and mm -hmm. you need probiotics and all these other. What other biomes are there and, and how, how, does, how do these chemicals affect those biomes? Well, they know now that we have bio, biomes control all of our systems. So that would be our, our mental acuity so that the biome is now starting is connected with Alzheimer's and ADD and uh, autism. They affect our neural pathways. They affect our, um, our resistance to our, our immunity, our immune systems. They are running the show, really. And so I think they, they estimate that in terms of like cells in your body, mm -hmm. you have 10 times more biome than you do what would be considered human cells, like bone and tissue. So lots of other things living within and on us. And, and they're, they're your village, right? right? They're right. your workers. And if you are exposed to pesticides, <coughs> excuse me, and pesticides, is a, the word pesticide means things that kill pests. So the pest, it's an all-inclusive term that includes insecticides and fungicides and herbicides and what else? Herbic rodenticides. Yeah, rodenticides. What's that? What is Killed rodents. Rodents. Rodent oh, rodent. Yeah. I, was, yeah. I was thinking rhododendron when you said that was <laughs> oh, all right. that would be a herbicide. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So they are, and, and they are absorbed through your body, through your skin, and your pets and your kids. They do break down in sunlight faster, but once you take them into the house with you, they persist. Can they can persist for a couple of years yeah. in your couch and your rug? And, you know. So. They're kind of a, a soup. And then nobody knows really what their effect is on our waterways because it's just, because I talked to Dr. Gobler about this, like, could you test and tell me what's in there? Yeah. And uh, there's that picture of the picture of Georgia Capond that we have on the in our thing is. here with the blue-green algae. Yeah. Um, so he was working on that and I was working with the homeowners to try to improve their lawn care practices. Mm -hmm. And it was all about nitrogen and phosphorus. But I was saying, you know, what about the pesticides? And they said, well, it's kind of a package. If you stop using the fertilizers, you're probably going to stop using the pesticides too, we would hope, because mm -hmm. the, the pesticide tests are so expensive. And there's about 300 different pesticides you could probably be testing for at any given time. And there's just a study that went out, right, that Suffolk County is the biggest county that uses pesticides in New York. In New York? Yep. Which probably puts us pretty pretty up there in the whole nation, too, then. It's safe to assume. Yeah, yeah. And what sets Suffolk County apart from most of the other counties in New York State? Agriculture. We have a lot of agriculture, but we have a Golf lot courses. of big lawns, and, and yeah, and actually a lot of our, a, a lot of the, um, the agriculture in Suffolk County is viniculture, is, is, and they use very, and more of the, a lot of the vineyards are now using reduced um, pesticide programs, okay. so.
can't really blame it on that. So, so it's loans. It's more than loans. Yeah. It's loans. Yeah. So do, do we have to rethink that fall on your face on, on the loan thing? Do we, do we have to change what we, what we envision as a, a beautiful suburban home? Not at all. It's beautifuler. Beautiful. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because first of all, your lawn will be green. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we do say le allow clover to come into your lawn, but you mow high so the clover, like, is in there. So, clover because fixes nitrogen. Nitrogen fixes it. Okay. And then, now, what what does that mean? What does it mean to fix nitrogen? So nitrogen fixers they grab the nitrogen from the air and then bacteria uses that nitrogen. And once the bacteria is done using that nitrogen, then it allows that nitrogen to be absorbed by the plants. Which is what we fertilize for, is to give the plants nitrogen. Yes. Okay. So cutting at what height? What height would you cut at? I'd like to cut between three and a half, and the smallest I cut is like three and a quarter. Three and a quarter. Yeah. And that allows the clover to spread underneath that top yeah, and be part of the whole lawn? Yeah, so the grass will be a little higher than the clover, mm -hmm. and then it's still beneficial. It, it gives it more of a textured look, so it's not so monoculture. All right, because right now when you see clover in a lawn, it's cut low, and the clover is kind of above the top cut. Um, but if you're cutting it three and a quarter, the clover mm -hmm. would be under the yeah. top cut. And another benefit is... It doesn't. It doesn't um, burn out when your dogs or your pets are peeing on it, the lawn because it can absorb that. Nitrogen. Yeah, like grass will just burn out. Yeah, and it really helps shade the soil, and that shade inhibits a lot of the weeds that require an open, sunny, hot spot to germinate, mm -hmm. and it does. And it does more of that moundy thing in the spring, I think, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, because now in, in the early spring, when the lawns are still dormant, right. you see more of that clumpy, higher than the grass look. Okay, Cl yeah. clover. But another benefit I just learned is also when you, when you mow the clover, the earthworms love it. So they come in and, and nibble on that, and they love it. And so you're aerating your soil. Aerate the soil, yeah. correct. Okay. Naturally. So I know you have some photos of what could be. Yes. Or, or what be. is in some places, yeah. actually, mm -hmm. because we wouldn't have a photo if it was not for real. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. Okay, this is, this, uh, is a local landscape design by um, Abby Lawless from Farm Design, and she's really good at this. But anybody can do it. This is a front lawn that isn't a lawn much anymore mm -hmm. <laughs> and and yet and in the winter they look beautiful too because a lot of them are standing seed pods for birds and the sun catches the grasses in a beautiful way and you don't once it's established you barely have to water unless we have serious drought conditions mm -hmm. and once it's established you don't get a lot of weeds so what's there what what, what do we have there besides I see a little patch of grass mm -hmm. um, there, there are actually a fair number of grasses mixed in there, and it's probably Deschampsias and uh, Carexes, fescues, I mean, not fescues, sedges. And then it looks like the blue looks is Baptisia, I believe. So that would have been taken about now or a little bit later Mid in the June, scene, yeah. right? So and then in, the, spring, in the back okay. there, what's that coming up in the back there, the white, Paul? Uh, uh, I can't tell. No. But they're all the standard, like, great American pollinator plants. It could be pycnanthemum, which is mountain mint. Might be, I think that's what it is. I think mountain it probably mint, yeah. is, because that's one that the, the, and there's about three or four different varieties. And um, Limpy, the Long Island Native Plant Initiative, they mm -hmm. have, they have uh, a really great list and plant sales. Rewild Long Island is doing Just had a plant sale. doing plant sales. Yep. More and more of the garden centers are starting to offer native plants, so go ask them, push them. Make sure they were not grown with neonics, which is a kind of 
pesticide that inhabits the plant and gets right into the pollen and the nectar, so it actually not so good for pollinators. And just, I wanted to add that yeah. beautiful picture also looks great in the winter, so do not cut that back in the fall. Okay. Yeah. But, <coughs> excuse me, you just said something. Uh, <coughs> pollen. Po the, that, <laughs> that, that plant that has Oh, neonics. Neo, neo. Neo. Yeah, neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids. Are, yeah. are like so that a lot of times the original of a pesticide was, t uh, this is an insecticide, was taken from a naturally occurring subject. So they're, they're, that would be nicotine. So, but these are the neonics, so they're synthetics. Mm -hmm. And they're what's called systemic. So they get into the system of a plant. Sometimes seeds are coated in, in agriculture a lot of seeds come coated with the neonic so as the seed germinates it's part of the plant and so every single part of that plant is poisonous to insects so they will not nibble on it or they won't do anything without dying and so it's very prevalent in the nursery industry to grow plants with neonics because they will produce sent to a garden center as pristine. But you don't know how long it's going to take to get it out of the system of the plant. So they can basically say, okay, this, this plant, shrub, whatever, is insect resistant? No, it's on. just, no, they don't tell anybody they use. They're oh, okay. using the neonics. <laughs> they're not proud of that. Yeah. Because it does eventually leave the plant. So it wouldn't be insect, and it, it, it wouldn't okay. kill insects forever. Some places I know of, when they can't be sure of the sources, they will keep the plants in quarantine for a certain amount of time until they test clean. Okay. But the irony of it was that it was discovered a few years ago that a lot of the big box stores were selling pollinator plants that were killing pollinators. Kill pollinator. right. So there's, there was a lot of talk about that. One of the things about, so most of them have made commitments to phase them out within, what, how long, Paul? Uh, I'm not sure when they phase out, but a lot of them, if you ask now, will provide that information. But you just have to educate yourself. So as a consumer, and, and I want to go and, and have a pollinator garden, I want to change my landscape, what do I say when I go to a nursery? What do I ask for? What do I just if they're Northeast natives, and have they been grown using neonics or just That's, organically yeah. grown organically is a good grown organically yeah. yeah okay and so it trusted sources one of the, one of the things like as part of the south fork sea farmers we most of our shows have been on uh on the base uh, on water uh, and the ecosystems happening within there uh, but the reason we're having this show is that there is a huge connection between our, our waterways and what's happening on land. Uh, we, we have covered things like septic tanks and things like that and mm -hmm. those changes that are needed. But if someone owns property on our bays, and it, it is all connected, but I feel like right on the bay um, has even more of an impact on our water qualities. What advice can you give or what, what, what can happen on that property to um, cut down on the the contamination of the water. I mean, I know everything we've talked of is a yes. But is there anything more that can be done? I feel like people with, with waterfront property are, are stewards of even more than just their property. They, they, yeah. they influence that water immensely. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they're very visible. Very visible. And so yes. that's like one of the things that I'm trying to do in that perception thing is give people clues, visual clues, to what, what does a nature-based landscape look like mm -hmm. and then it's like what does your landscape say about you so if you're mowing right to the water and your lawn is green before anybody else is in the spring that means you've just loaded it with a, an early green up fertilizer mm -hmm. and instead of being like lord of the manor proud of that what your landscape is saying about you is that i don't care yes i don't care about my drinking water i don't care about the fish the oysters and anything else I'll be eating out of that water. That's basically what you're saying. So how do we change that? Because I agree 100% that that's exactly, that it, 
broadcast that to me. Every time I'm out in my kayak and I'm looking around Akabonic, um, yes, I see people with what, what I was raised to think was a beautiful lawn, and now to me that says, I don't care. I, I agree 100%. Okay. So how, how, can we, how can we change that? Oh, I, I, there's a picture in there that you could bring up. Okay. With of a meadow, the meadow grasses. Meadow grasses. And they're in the fall, and that is a buffer area on the edge of Akabonic Harbor. Is that? Yeah. And all summer long, it's amazingly, it's green, and and then all winter long, it, it like when there's dew and, or frost on the grasses. It's filled with birds. It's filled with life, as opposed to boring, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. way less boring. And it filters all of the water coming down to Akabana Carver. All the runoff. And all it needs right. is to get cut once a year. That is it. Once, once a year, cut down to? I, we cut it to about 12 inches using weed whackers. OK. So that the, uh, the stems of the grasses are still standing and they're open so that all the insects, like fireflies, can, okay. well, fireflies lay their eggs actually in the basal part of the plant mm -hmm. down at the ground, but by not cutting low, we're protecting them. Our fireflies are probably in the worst shape of any one of our insects. I haven't seen them in years. Actually, I, now that you mention it, I'm like, yeah, I used to be that thousands meadow. when I was a little kid going yeah. and getting, you know, they but were everywhere. That meadow in that picture is full of them because there's no night light to distract them, and that once a year cutting that happens in April, as late as possible, when the green starts to get maybe six inches high, then we cut it eight to 12 above the green part and lug all that away. So you're keeping the soils a bit lean and that way the, um, the weeds are less likely to get a meal. And those are just, those are native grasses. There's little blue stem and switchgrass. Panicum, yeah. So fireflies, as a little case in point. Yeah. Uh, I need them because I, I, if you need to watch little children play with fireflies. Mm -hmm. What's their role? Why, why do we need fireflies ecosystem-wise? Well, they are actually voracious bug eaters. They're like I don't know if you call that cannibals. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they eat. I don't know if they eat other fireflies, but they eat a lot of insects in the larval state. Okay. And um, they, but they are also food for a lot of insects and birds. And I just, I also think that they're an indicator species. And I think right now that's their biggest role to play. They, they hold such, well, you know, a fond place in everybody's heart. Yes. And when you realize that you're, if you realize that what you're doing is causing them to go extinct, maybe you'd rethink that. Like, mm -hmm. could that be a message? I mean, the monarchs got their day in the sun, and people went from hating milkweed to loving milkweed. Right. And they don't, and they, and when the monarch caterpillar is eating the milkweed leaf, they're saying, yay, they're not right. calling the spray guy. Right, right. So, Education. can we do some of that for fireflies too and bring them back? Because if we did, you could, it's a visible, it's a very visible response to mm -hmm. improved practices. It's an indicator of a, a more balanced ecosystem. Uh-huh, and better, cleaner water. Cleaner water, right. And, and really healthier us. Yes. And, Children and, and pets, mm -hmm. it, it, really. What you had said before about us absorbing these things for us, I, and I, I thought of ingesting them, I thought of, you know, in our food, I never even thought of absorbing, and, and that's just another reason that we have to get back to a more intelligent balance. Yeah. And you mentioned that you guys had a talk on septic tanks. Yes. And the meadow that Edwina just showed. I think if we think about it, the two key words there are filtration system and uh, the fact that it's natural. We don't have to do anything. And it's a buffer. It's a buffer. You don't want your lawn up to the water, it's a buffer. Mm -hmm. Those are the key words, a buffer, and it serves a filtration. Even something you both said earlier about having, uh, uh, changing the size of your lawn. When I think about these estates, these 
large houses on the waterfront with these massive, massive mm -hmm. lawns and, and just rethinking that, oh, what do I need to entertain? You know, uh, mm -hmm. am I going to have a party of 10,000? Probably not. Um, so what do you need for your entertainment area? What, you know, the, um, what will get used and what can I give back? Exactly. Yeah, and so we say, think of your lawn as an area rug instead of wall to wall. Okay. Is yeah. one way to do it. Think about who's walking where, and if the only person who walks on it is the mowing person, then that's an opportunity. Mm. <coughs> There's a saying that lawn is the least expensive thing to install and the most expensive to maintain. To maintain. But I also think of it as the least imaginative and the least interesting. So that's another thing your landscape can say mm -hmm. about you is, I didn't have a better idea. Okay. And, yes. And I, I can't blame people too because the, the industry is there, right? Now they sell sod, so they ju you just put it down. You don't even have to wait for the seed to right. germinate. That, that's so much like the wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And sod is handy at times. Yeah. It, it holds erosion, mm -hmm. so if you do need a place where you want to stabilize, but that's if that's going to be long. Right. And, but sod is grown with a lot of chemicals, so you're importing that from the start. And now you've got a, an addict already. Correct. Right, so well, you can transition. You, we you do. Can, we, you, you overseed with better grasses, more lawn. How, how would you how would you transition from that that chemical dependent lawn to uh, a? I would say start with a soil test. Soil. Okay. And then if you have sod, you most likely have Kentucky bluegrass in there. So in the fall time, you aerate and you overseed and add more. Um, less resource intense varieties like fescues mm -hmm. so less water less for fertilization and throw down some clover clover, clover. seed yeah which you might want to wait for the springtime for clover because it actually the seed does better in the spring than in the fall but your grass seeds will do better in the fall and if you do nothing you'll get clover yeah a lot of people spend a lot really? of time and money getting rid of clover that they did not i, I know that people people don't like clover and this is really crazy because it attracts bees and they might step on a bee i have heard it, that so many times i know but that's um an excuse yes i i agree i agree it's yeah. i don't know anybody who has Stepped my lawn is full of clover yeah i know that's uh not hasn't happened and you know what w the bees we really want to attract are native bees as opposed to honeybees are not native mm -hmm. and so they're here to pollinate the plants that are not native that came with them primarily food crops and fruit but they do out compete our native bees when they're in the wild landscape and so what you want to do is put stuff out for the native bees as much as possible. So what are the native bee species? What, what? Oh, there's over, um, there's over, there's so, like 465 different ones in the, in the United States. And yes. New York State alone has what, 40 or 50? So, you know, the only one that comes to mind for me is a bumblebee. That's one. That, that's the only one I, I can relate yeah. to except there, for it, honeybees. Right now, the, um, the one you see a lot of is the carpenter bees. They're humming outside your house. Okay. Looking yes. for a place yes. to <laughs> drill a hole. Drill a hole. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. But, but they don't. St but most native bees. I think there's only like one out of all those hundreds, and probably not in New York State that can actually sting and cause it an allergic re response. But most of them ha either don't have a stinger, or their stinger's too weak to penetrate your skin. They're completely non-aggressive because mm. they don't. Most of them are solitary bees. They don't have a hive, so right. they don't have a bee to protect. And this is not hornets we're talking about. Right. You have, I'm thinking of yellow jackets. Hornets and wasps. What does a yellow they're, jacket fit into this? They're they're not nice. Yeah, yeah I know. I've I've had. <laughs> no, if they were in your them. clover, we'd have a whole different story. <laughs> yeah. But they don't they don't pollinate. Yellow jackets no. aren't interested no. in pollen. Okay. Maybe nectar, but they 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 mostly like sweets and and your beer. 
They want right. to get yes, in they your, do. for your Coke can. Yes. Right? Yeah. 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 Okay. So they're looking for sweets, but um, but they yeah, and they're mean. They're aggressive, but they live in the ground. They're in the ground. Okay. So yeah. they they aren't nesting up anywhere in the house mm -hmm. or, okay. No. Then you know most of the time when you figure out. There, we like to say that like, if you don't know anything about something, you don't know its name, you don't know what it is, you don't know its life cycle, you don't even know if it stings, could you find out before you kill it? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and don't, don't call a, an exterminator, because you know what <laughs> they will tell you. That's their role. Yeah. Um, I want to go back a little bit to clover, because that is so interesting to me that um, the lawns grow into the right height. It, it can really, I always pictured it only in patches, but it can be part of the whole lawn. And I can see it even taking on a, a, a nicer, deeper U with that as part of it. Are there other plants uh, that are also nitrogen fixing that, that can fill that role, uh, you know, shrubs or, or any, any other plants that, that can do that same task? I don't know about shrubs, but I, I just learned that the eastern red bud is a nitrogen fixer, oh, and that's really? a small tree. Because, oh, it's leguminous. Yeah. It's basically the, the legumes. Mm -hmm. So, right. Amorpha fruticosa, not, I don't even know what the common name is, but um, also, um, what is it, Chemicrista, which is, uh, oh, what's the? Uh, I'm not good with the common names. Yeah, isn't that terrible? We sound so <laughs> so bad to not know the common names, but but they're not very accurate. So right, right. when we're talking, uh, it'll come to oh partridge pea, that's Camacrista. It's a self-sowing annual, but it looks like a shrub, and it blooms all summer. And it's a really great plant, and the pollinators love it. And Native. that would add nitrogen to your garden. So in a general in a general context, any any legume family plant, which is your beans, your peas, and your cover crops, and cover crops include clover, okay, vetch, and alfalfa, which is commonly used in raised garden beds for your vegetables. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't want to plant vetch. Yeah, gotcha. All right, so there are options for the gardens also. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I was, if I had my one acre plot and I wanted to go from my beautiful lawn to um, a more uh, eco-friendly visual, is it going to be more expensive? It might be in the beginning, but your maintenance will be a lot less because there's less stuff to do, less inputs. And if you work with what you have on your property, I think it will be comparable. You can grow a wildflower garden from seed. That's the cheapest, but it but you have to be prepared to wait. Right. right. But if, if you don't want to spend any money, you can do it that way. It's not impossible. And we often suggest that people mix in some non-native annuals just to fill the space while the other ones are coming on. So then you do have a kind of fabulous display for the first two years while the slower stuff is getting going. So you said, and I was surprised you said mix in non-natives. Should we be mostly using native plants, or should there just be a balance? Um, I mean, there are a lot of non-native shrubs and plants here now. Mm -hmm. um, are they okay, or are they harmful? Depends. So you should get familiar, right, with what mm -hmm. an invasive looks like, what the invasives are here. So what are they? Tell me. Well, one that, <laughs> one that isn't taken off the market yet, but I feel probably will, should be soon, is butterfly bush. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. No, I, go go I'm, on the I'm Long shocked. Island. I, I, go down the Long Island Railroad and see what's lining both sides of the tracks. That'll tell you something. Okay. Butterfly bush is not native, and it actually only provides a very small portion of a butterfly's needs. It just... They, they provide nectar, but the, the plant, insect, or animal relationship is extraordinarily complex. So in most cases, the actual components in the nectar are key to that, its, its companion's needs. So the, the insect that is feeding on that nectar is getting exactly what it needs when it needs it. 
-hmm. And so it might be a level of protein or a kind of sugar, the percentage of sugar. And it's, it's really, we're learning so much more about that now. And the butterfly bush isn't really tuned to our native bees, so. So, the, I mean, it was nicely named for marketing, uh, but oh, it, yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't help our insect population. Not really, but it does attract them to your yard. And so I don't know which ones are the ones most likely now to escape into the wild. Maybe they all are, I'm not sure. But there isn't any harm other than that. Before they started to get invasive, there was nothing wrong with planting one. Mm -hmm. You just want to make sure that you also had all the real things that butterflies need. Okay. And I guess an equivalent would be miscanthus, a grass that a lot of people like, which is an invasive. Does it have a, a common name? Feather reed grass, I think, right? Yeah, feather reed grass. Or okay. silver reed. Some people call it silver reed, I think. Okay. It's the tall one, and in the fall it gets those blooms. Oh, yeah, that okay, the little mm -hmm. everywhere. Okay. Yes, yes, you see. Start looking in the roadsides and places yeah. where they're popping up. Okay. And as an invasive species, why is that bad? Just because it's taking from the native? or It's taking the place of something native that could do a lot more uh, good for our wildlife. That already has a, a, a symbiotic relationship yes. with our, for our wildlife. Yeah, in the meadow next to, um, and there's a meadow um, next to Akabana Harbor that I see a lot. And it's being taken over by miscanthus. So it, the miscanthus came from a planting, I think, upwind, mm -hmm. where some people have a lot of it planted. And it's so little by little, it's it gets huge. You know, the big meadow like, in Akabana Harbor? The one that belonged to Seal Downs, and it, it's called, there's the Barbara Hale Meadow, mm -hmm. and then Seal Downs, who died, so this is very local now, okay. to Springs. And so she, she um, sold her land to CPF okay. before she died. She was 94. She was a friend. And she did a film on grasses. She was a great environmentalist. And she started the Akabonic Protection Committee okay. to save the waters of, the, of Akabonic Harbor. And she um, would be very sad to see how the Miscanthus are taking over her meadow um, because now her house is gone because CPF doesn't keep houses, mm -hmm. and it's supposed to be restored to a native place, so mm -hmm. I'm not sure what will happen. Hmm. The Aquaponic Protection Committee has a presentation tomorrow night at the library. I know. Yeah. I'll be there. Me too. Yeah. yeah. Good. A very easy thing to do now with the miscanthus is cut it in the spring so it doesn't get to seed. Oh, okay. But the best thing would be to rip yeah. it out. Rip it out. Yeah. Or just... Yeah. Keep cutting it. Yeah. Just, just mow as long, it. As long as it doesn't seed and spread. But if you actually want to be rid of it, you mm -hmm. can. Then it's really hard to dig out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. I've also heard about compost tea. And I don't even know what that is. Do you do so? I do, but so basically in its most basic form, it's just water infused with organic compost. And there's a simple DIY recipe that you could do if you already compost your uh, food waste, your garden waste, mm -hmm. then you could just, you know, in a five gallon bucket, you could mix some compost in there and make sure you, you know, are turning it every twice a day at least to give it oxygen. But the beauty about compost tea is that it's a di it's easily absorbed, nutrient-rich food for your plants. It's it, mycorrhizal, I mean, and it's 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 the biome thing, but, full okay. of bacteria, fungi, all that okay. good stuff. Do you feed yeah. it at all? Do you give it molasses and? You can, you know, once you get past the basics, you could add kelp. You could add uh, molasses. I haven't tried molasses yet, but kelp. Yeah. kelp. You need kelp. You powder it, and then it. you would need an aquarium uh, aerator. You know, so it's mm -hmm. continuously Evolver. moving. Yep. I would. Yeah, the the guys who are really like the high end, mm -hmm. the, the Nofa guys, 
they even balance them towards more fungal or more bacterial. Fungal for um, shrubs and trees and bacterial for lawns. The one thing I would say is don't buy a packaged mix. They just, first of all, they didn't come from your area. So your own compost has your own native soil biome that you're, pro that you're propagating. And also, I, I doubt that there's very much in it that's alive. Right. right. How can it be in that packet? Yeah. Right. So how do you, how do you apply that? You can put it in a spray bottle and add it directly to the leaves or put it around the, the just pour, pour, it, pour yeah, it around the base. On the drip line of your plants, yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. A better way to fertilize. Or well, not, I guess it is fertilizer. It's feeding the soil. Feeding the soil. Okay, I like that. That's product. your micro thing. Right. Although everything has a, a biome. Like yeah. even a leaf surface has a biome. Mm hmm and it, I think it makes the connection to that it's living. So once you make compost, he, it doesn't last long because it's living and the nutrients are in there. Right. They need to be used. It needs to be back, yes. in, back in the system. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense. And use fresh water to make it not chlorinated water, yeah. not town right. water. Okay. And you can probably go online and, and Google yeah. and, and find a quick way to do this. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah, actually sounds like a fun little garage experiment. If you have compost already, it's just yeah. another step. Yeah. yeah. Is one other thing, because we're almost out of time, but I wanted to touch on the, the topic of um, basically manipulating the landscape to change drainage patterns. Um, if you guys, if you could bring up that one picture of uh, Sokai's Road that I had taken. Th this is uh, some work the town is doing on the side of the road. And this is right next to the little creek that runs into the headwaters of uh, Three Mile Harbor. Now, my assumption is they're trying to divert water from going directly into the creek to these like mini recharge basins mm -hmm. so that it, gets, it has to go and be filtered through the land instead of going directly into the creek so we're not getting all the nitrogen from the runoff directly. And from road things like the oil, the tires, the, there's right, a okay. lot of pollution that comes off of a road, water running over a road. The, t the actual wear of the tires winds up being there on the yeah, road. Sure right, does. that makes sense. That makes sense. So that same thought of redirecting water drainage, could that be used by property owners on, on waterfront properties to um, change drainage to so it's absorbed instead of going right into the bay it's it's a, it would be kind of a, a dramatic response when plants will do just fine okay not necessary not unless you've changed the pitch of your land considerably so if you've built like a big steep slope of some sort okay and and the water is racing down but if you're working with the natural contour just allowing the plants that are natural to that contour and to the water's edge i think it would i think that would so do you think it. like those the grasses we had in the earlier picture mm -hmm. um would prevent any quick flow of water right into the bay and absorb it and may have it go down first mm -hmm. the buffer natural filtration system again i think that'll do it unless it's a very dramatic construction site that was right well, it ra yeah. raised the elevation for yeah. some reason uh, yeah because that would be an expensive solution to dig a ditch and right and right those are and then it has to be pitched i mean those those are set so they pitch in it and then they overflow into a drain mm -hmm. and that's like because the state's giving a lot of money for this kind of stormwater management now natural stormwater management i was wondering why great. we have quite a few projects. We had them on Springs Fireplace Road too. Yeah. Interesting to watch what they chose for plants, most of which have since been eaten by the deer. But um, well, right now on um, Stephen Hands, they're doing a, and oh gosh, big drainage. But they just planted one section with all bushes and and I think even some small trees even. But it, w were those plants chosen thoughtfully? I mean, I, you know, I don't want to. 
I haven't seen the list. Take I mean, the, the one huge drainage ditch, it, it's quite large. Um, they've planted with bushes on both sides. Uh, oh, thoroughly. Because I don't go there anymore because you get rooted way yeah, around and right. I never know when it's going to be closed or not. I go on weekends to see the progress. Okay, then I will do that <laughs> this weekend. Because, you know, I would imagine it's a state project, right? Is that a state road? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Because if it's a county road, then then it, that determines who chose the plants. If it's East Hampton Town, we have the best natural resources department. They know plants. They really, they're really I good. Somebody, yeah. <laughs> no, they really are good. Good. Yeah. yeah I, like they're, they're Yeah, I don't know who's in control of that project. I'm but sure. I would. It's but it's interesting to drive by and see the, the, all the bushes that are in there. Yeah, I was surprised they put the these mats down first, the organic looking mats, and then all of a sudden there were shrubs everywhere. So, oh. hopefully it was a good choice. We shall see. And another reason why that wouldn't apply to like a residence is because of, imagine all that material, where it came from, and again we go into all these inputs, right. traveled, fossil fuels. I was just thinking of small little, yeah. you know, I I if I had a place on my land where it was obvious there was erosion going on, how could I redirect? But you're right, the right plantings would take care of it. Mm -hmm. Most likely, and then there are things, you know, rain gardens, where mm -hmm. people do, if, they, if you have a spot that doesn't drain well, or where all the water's coming off the roof of your house, like all your leaders, or if they're still daylighting, nowadays they make you put them on, into the ground, but, um, which is kind of a shame, because that water doesn't really serve the plants. Right, right. Uh, true, so, yeah. Um, yeah, you can make, you can dish it a bit, and then usually rain gardens have a drain in the bottom, that's set about six inches above the base of the, so it's it's complicated. Again, you know, it, it's better if you can just get everything to work with plants right. and not regrading and yeah. tearing stuff up. But if you're if you're starting from zero, you've just built a house and you're just installing. Choosing the right plants is step one. Right plants, right place. Right place. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's key. Um, I think we're just about out of time. Uh, I thank you very much for, for spending time with us today. I learned a lot. I hope those who watch also learn a lot. Um, and thank you for joining us for another episode of the South Pork Seed Farmers Presents.